that, that court, so called Supreme Court, has claimed uh, power and authority they do not have. There's nothing in the Constitution that gives them what they have usurped. It's not there. Now, I'm going to do a program to, on that to show you that it's not there. Okay. And so, in 1973, they went further. They went and they proclaimed themselves to be God. They declared God dead. And they said, we will take what God has made unlawful and make it legal by license. If you purchase a license, you can destroy the image of God, transgress God's dominion. And I had a judge one time come he, in, uh, on a false pretense. He asked me out to dinner. And he said he wanted to, to get involved in the prison ministry. And, you know, we could use a judge in the prison ministry. We have, you know, we run in situations where we could use some legal help, you know. And so I went... And I had dinner with him in a really nice place. And then I found out it wasn't that at all. What he wanted to know was about biblical law. He wanted to know where do we get the institution of divine human government. He didn't know. Okay. So I went through it and I, and I showed him from the beginning. Where do we got you know, the five points of divine human government? <coughs> where we got to pardon? In Isaiah here, what you're going to read. No, no, that comes to the Noahic Covenant in Genesis chapter 9. Okay. And uh, we've gone through that time many times here. But anyhow, the five points are, are the very first point is to whom it was given. That's Genesis 9, verse 9, 10, verse 12, verse 15, and 16. To all mankind for perpetual generations and everlasting covenant which spans every dispensation. The second point was the intent. And that's Genesis 9, in the first few verses. Man was to govern for God. Man was to govern for God. The third point, the third point is the most important point. That's verses five through seven. That's where we got the statute, okay, of the death penalty. God gave man dominion over all of the environment. The first five verses, He kept dominion of man for Himself, and He said, "Whoever destroys the image of God, who transgresses God's domain, in other words, it's like breaking into God's home, okay, when you transgress His dominion." Okay, he kept man for himself. Then he has to forfeit his own life. And then the, the fourth point was the means by which man was to govern for God. God's statutes, God's laws, God's covenants, God's ordinances, God's precepts, God's covenants, all of these things. And then the fifth point was, now you can, on each one of these points, you can preach several messages, okay, which we do. I go into it in real depth, depth. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written a number of papers on that. But anyhow, the fifth point was this, that all nations and peoples that are in compliance with the first four will be at peace and not at war with God. You look around the world today, I don't see too many nations that are in peace with God today. No. In fact, I can't see any. Anyhow, here in Isaiah <laughs> chapter no, uh, 56, verse 9, All ye beasts of the field, come to devour ye, all ye beasts in the forest. It's an interesting thing. There have been people talking on these late night talk shows about animals that have been turning on people. And I thought that that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Another thing that you've been hearing, which is strange, I don't know if the rest of you, but I've heard on several different where they're hearing a trumpet sound. People have been hearing it. You heard that too? Yeah, yeah. They've been hearing trumpet sound, and nobody can find the source of these yeah. trumpets. Mm -hmm. It's happening all over the place, okay? And, uh, I heard that before, um, a year or so ago, that I heard yeah. that Yeah, well, it's been going on for a yeah, while. A yeah. years, yeah. And, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so that's another one of those strange things. He goes on to say, His watchmen are blind, they are all ignorant, they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, and loving to slumber. He's talking about the pastors, the shepherds. They don't have the courage. So many of them today are in it for a paycheck, but not in it. They're not called and raised up. See, if a pastor is called and raised up of God, first of all, he's going to be bold. He's, if he's going to be whippy and, and whiny, he's not son of God. Number two, because he's going to have the confidence. He's going to have the Holy Ghost. You know. Proverbs 28, verse 1 says what? The righteous are as bold as lions. Okay. And he's going to be preaching the gospel in season enough. He's not going to be compromising, is he? Yet, they are greedy dogs, which can never have enough. They are shepherds who cannot understand. They look to their own way, everyone from gain to his own quarter. With these prosperity preachers out there today, you see what's going on. 
They can never have enough. They can never have enough. One of them was telling me that uh, one of them just bought another Learjet. This, uh, uh, that one woman, Prosperity Preacher, she has three Learjets. Uh, that uh, Crypto Dollar just bought one that was like $45 million. Mm -hmm. Uh, was that George Brothers, whatever her name is? Uh, yeah, George. Bruce Bruce Myers. Myers. Bruce Myers. Myers. Really? Yeah. yeah. So she's got three jets. <coughs> no, no, so. Copeland says he deserves <laughs> one. Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> and you know, I'm still working on my first Piper Cup. <laughs> Single engine prop. <laughs> but when I get my glider, I won't be glider. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lord. But you see, they, they they can never have enough. They can never have enough. Never satisfied. Right. And and if you go over to Ezekiel chapter thirty-four, and they will. Some of these, again, some of these preachers, these prosperity preachers, but I remember growing up, there were preachers that, that would continuously tell the people, don't try to read the Bible, don't try to understand uh, the Bible, because it's, it's not for you lay people. It's too complicated for you lay people. And just uh, just let the pastors or the priests, they'll explain it to you, just trust them. Well, that's what Catholic rely on. Yeah. Is well, the priest to tell them. Well, you, not so much today as they used to be. They used to be. There are some Catholics out there today that actually have Bible studies. Okay, I know some. They used to be. They were forbidden. They were forbidden to have a Bible study. And uh, mm. and they used to be. They were were not even allowed to own a Bible. Their own. Okay, yeah. Now, we start in verse one of uh, chapter thirty-four of Isaiah. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do not feed, that do feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's talking about, first of all, taking care of their needs, but, but mostly what he's referring to is the knowledge of the word of God. Well, they study and they go to school, and they, but they're not giving it to the people. And knowledge is power, isn't it? Mm. Amen. They eat the fat, and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed <clears throat> not the flock. The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. And they, they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became meat to the, all the beasts of the field when they were there and scattered. My watch, or my sheep wandered through all the mountains and the, by every hill. Now he's, he's talking about his people here. He's not talking about little bad, bad white sheep. He's talking about the, the, the people. And he's giving you examples of how these shepherds, these pastors, their leaders, were not in obedience to the word of God. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherds search for my flock. But they shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Now, let me ask you, does that sound like the Prosperity Church movement? Yes. Right. It yeah. was all about experience. <coughs> yeah. Therefore, all you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding and the flock. Neither shall thy shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may be not being meat for them. I was. We were talking here about the other day about this uh, word of faith a pastor who used to use the building that we used for our church building after us. We came in. Uh, he would come in. He was the fellow. Uh, what was his first name? Walter McDonald's. Walter. Yeah. Him and his, his wife. And, and man, they they ran just basically one of these prosperity type shakedowns. She's a very pretty woman, and. Uh, they used that, and he actually, 
uh, he actually one day, uh, and he said, you know, I've got something very important to tell you about, something I think you'd be interested in. And, and I said, what is it? He said, well, I'll tell you over dinner. He said, I'm going to buy you. So we, we went out and bought me a nice steak dinner. And he actually wanted me to fleece the flock with him. He wanted me to be a part of the, uh, he says, you know, God wants us to prosper. You know, we have, you know, and he's, you know, he come right out and said, you know, let's be one of the shakedown the shepherds. Well, I, I literally picked him up three out of the radio station. He came over there. He came in again. I told him, I don't want to ever, don't ever, don't ever come to me again. And I, I picked him up three him out the door. And he's as big as I was. I was pretty angry. Anyhow, one day I came back. I forgot something to church. And, we left and I went back and she didn't know that I was there. I came in through the back door, you know, and she was telling the women they had taken up an offering. Sometimes they would take like three offerings during the service. And she was saying, is this all that you're going to put in this plate? She said, I'm going to pass this plate again and you better do better than you've done. If not, Walter was going to curse your purse. He will put a curse on your purse and uh, you'll have nothing then. And so when she turned around and she saw me standing there, her face turned as red as Kim's sweater. She 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 knew she got caught. The, the, you know, but it was really and some of those women came to me and I said, why don't you leave there? They were crying. They were crying. Unbelievable. But anyhow. Here is what he's, he's, the point that he's making here. Thus the Lord God, behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flocks at their hand, and cause them to cease from the feeding of the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. For I will deliver my flock from their mouth. They may not be meat for them. And then, this, when I was a young preacher, uh, I heard this over and over. If you keep this up, you're going to bring the government down on all of us. If you keep this up, you're going to bring the government down on all of us. And uh, one of my mentors, who was a, a good man, he, a uh, very well-known pastor, he came to me and he said, you know, I love your zeal, and I don't want you to diminish your zeal for the ministry. He says, but son, you got to realize that if you get these guys mad at you, one day they're going to need you to lead them because they have no leader." And if they're mad at you, they're not going to follow you. I said, why would I want a bunch of cowards following me? I said, they'll just get me killed. And, and he said, well, you might have a good point there. But, but, uh, but I praise the good Lord for the pastors that have the courage out there to, to be men of God and, and that God has risen up. And we have some good ones out there. And I praise the good Lord. I encourage people to come and be a part of an unregistered New Testament church. Did you know that you now have 50,000, 50,000, which is free, what is FEMA, Homeland Security, credentialed pastors in this country? 50,000 credentialed pastors. And do you know what they're telling their people? They're telling their people uh, that the, you know, they are told, first of all, do not tell your people. Do not tell your people uh, that you're a part of this. Don't even mention it. And if and, and listen, they're telling them, if they should ask you if you are a part of this, deny it. They're telling them flat out right lights of their congregations. Then they're telling them to uh, tell them that they must have, that Romans 13 teaches that they must obey the government on every level of you know, I've got the documentation right in, the, in my briefcase, if anybody wants to see it. That you must obey the government on all levels. Now in response to that, the pastors who are credentialed pastors, in case there's a national emergency, there's an earthquake or uh, some other national disaster, that pastor and his family will be the first. They'll have a pass and they'll be the first to get food, water, and medical help. Yeah. All they have to do is sell off their congregation. Yeah. That's all. Do you see what the 501c3 does? Yeah. 
See, because with that 501c3, they're telling these pastors, you know, actually, we can force you. You've signed a contract with us. The state, <coughs> the state if you have signed in that agreement, the state is your head. Anyhow, yeah, I have a good friend, Jay Menifee. He was the founder, and I was with him in the very beginning uh, when Ben Paulus, Jay, myself, uh, Mark Hassett, who was a judge, Ron Suster, another judge, we started what was called Northeast Ohio Roundtable. Back today, you, you, it's called the Ohio Roundtable. But we started that back in the 70s. And Jay wrote this book, Dear Pastor, Only You Can Rescue America. Only You Can mm -hmm. Rescue America. I want to read to you, <coughs> because again, like I said, from time to time, or for all those years as a young pastor, I couldn't, I wondered why in, in 1962, why didn't the pastors have courage? I said, where's, where's your courage? Where's your courage? Well, there were a few that had courage, okay? But the rest all ganged up on them. I remember one time I had gone to an ordination, and when I walked into the ordination, and these are Baptist preachers, there was a bunch of them in there, and as you walked into the, uh, it was the lunch, they were having lunch, it was a big, big hall, and it was very noisy, and as I walked in, all of a sudden, it got totally quiet. You could have heard a pin drop. Now that's strange, and as I'm walking through there, as I walked past, I heard one of them say, that's him, that's him. <laughs> it made me think they might have been talking about me, you see. So I went in there, and uh, I looked, you know, and you would look, and they would look the other way. So I sat down at a table right in the middle, and uh, this tall, thin preacher come over to me. He said, do you mind if I join you? I said, help yourself, okay. And then before he sat down, he said, it's good to sit down and eat with a real man. And uh, here, these guys have been complaining about me, talking about me being a man. Oh, I was going to bring the government down. And their people were going to expect them to have to act like men. Their people were going to expect them to stand up against the sins of abortion or to stand up against the sodomy. And at that place, we were at the time, we were really fighting, too, about the pornography going into the, <coughs> the convenience stores. Why? You know, that's not dignified. They had they, they weren't comfortable in doing that and, and leaving their quiet, peaceful little prissy home. See, now let me ask you a question. The Great Commission does it say to bring the gospel out to all the world? Teaching, baptizing, does it say to take it out to every nation? Yes. Or does it say find yourself a comfortable place in the pulpit and uh, hide out? So we're to bring this out here. When you walk out that door, that's a field for you. Yeah. It's an evangelism field. Right? Yes. Amen. You see, in here, the pastor is the preacher in the pulpit. Okay? Out there, you're all preachers. That's yes, right. Once you get out there, you're all preachers. That's right. <coughs> Here's what he writes. And this is interesting in his book. He says... Russian communism, which eliminated private property and promised jobs for all, fell after about 70 years when they began to exhaust the nation's physical assets. <coughs> Much the same way our America way of life built on biblical teachings is beginning to fall because of our neglect in teaching each generation the love of God and all that He has commanded. With each generation, we drift further and further from knowing biblically the difference between good and evil. We are losing a biblical worldview, and we are losing biblical conscience. We are becoming a nation that knows not God and what has done for our country, what he has done for our country. For nearly three generations, we have been secularizing our consciences. We are very close as a nation uh, to not knowing biblically what is evil from what is good. Young people are opting for cohabitation, meaning plain house, instead of marriage. And the fastest growing institution is single parent families. Now this and many other trends show that we are near losing the assets of our conscious. Today, for the last several years, the biggest graduation gift 
that girls are getting when they graduate from high school are fake breasts. Those, those uh, <laughs> breast implants. Now that, and that's what their mothers are giving them. Okay. If, if a person's conscience has decayed into the secular beliefs, he will not be open to evangelism. He will believe he has no need of Christ's offer of salvation. Charles Finney, the great evangelist, the president of Oberlin College, boy, if, if he knew what Oberlin College oh, is today, he would be uh, mm -hmm. very, very uh, disappointed. Mm -hmm. Saw this coming as early as 1873. He prophetically stated in the last paragraph of a sermon titled, The Decay of Conscience. If there is a decay of conscience, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the public press lacks moral discernment, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the church is degenerate and worldly, the pulpit is responsible for it. If the world loses its interest in Christianity, the pulpit is responsible for it. If Satan rules in our halls of legislation, the pulpit is responsible for it. If our politics become so corrupt that the very foundations of our government are ready to fall away, the pulpit is responsible for it. That's what I've been saying for years, and that's what's got all these prissy preachers so angry at me. Mm -hmm. God's Word puts it far more forcefully and far more personally. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I also will reject you from being my priest. Since that's you have right. forgotten the law of your God, I will forget your children. Mm -hmm. Why has that happened? Yes, yes. That prophecy we've seen fulfilled. Woe to them who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Therefore as a tongue of fire consumes the stubble, a dry grass collapses into the flame. I don't think he's using the King James word for word, is he? Okay. But, so their root will become like rot, and their blossoms blow away as dust, for they have rejected the law of the Lord. Of hosts and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. On this account, the anger of the Lord has burned against his people, and he has stretched out his hand against them and struck them down. In 2011, Dr. Erwin W. Lutzer, pastor of Moody Bible Church, was quoted in a newsletter as saying that we have already crossed the line and lost any chance of restoration. I do not believe that, Pastor. We can still restore our nation if we start right now. God spared Nineveh, and if we cry out to God and change our ways, He would surely spare us. As a matter of fact, He has promised that. Well, it's an interesting thing. Here in the springtime, we had a pastor's conference, and there was about uh, there was well, about 400 pastors came out, and I was there, and. And, uh, and Jay was one of the speakers there. And there at this pastor where they had this nice big banquet uh, brunch, if you will, and all of these speakers, Rick Santorum was one of the speakers and they brought him. Mm -hmm. I looked around and some of these very same preachers that were saying, you're going to bring the government down and all of us were there. And they were there because now they're afraid. Mm -hmm. They're afraid because of Islam. And we're having a conference, another conference coming up soon, on 20th of February. And one of the, we're going to have speakers there, and the speakers are going to be, what, some of what they're going to be talking about is where, right now, you know, when the, those DVDs that we showed you here, at that time there were like 30 jihadist training camps in America, now that there's over 90. And they're going to be showing you, talking about where they're at. And again, this is happening now. The Obama has brought in his Muslims, and uh, he has brought in the jihadists. And he, right, in, right at the White House, the Muslim Brotherhood leadership goes in there and meets us. When I tell you on the radio that we are a nation right now and occupied under the communist Islamic occupation, we are a nation that is occupied under communism. We are occupied right now. Yes. Yeah. And so. I, I don't agree with her. I think we still would have time uh, if there's repentance, and it's got to be actual repentance. But I want you to go over to Hebrews chapter 
by it because it's not all the pastor's fault. It's not all. You see, the reason that so many of these pastors are feminized, and by the way, they started, I remember back in the early 60s, they were a feminized and they were going into the seminaries. And that's when they were teaching the Enlightenment, teaching the neo evangelical, talking about how the, the pastors had to get in touch with their feminine selves, part so that they could counsel families. And that, you know, we, we said back there that that was absolute foolishness, okay? Uh, God didn't give men feminist parts. We men are supposed to be men, right? You know, this is, is a absolute, this was so called at that time the psychology. Well, <coughs> what it was was lunacy, absolute lunacy. And certainly it was. God is not the author of confusion, is he? Mm, no. And so in Hebrews chapter 5, we talk about starting in verse 11. Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when for the time you ought to be teaching, you have need of one to teach you again. Which are the first principles of the oracles of God, that are become such as have need of milk and not strong drink. Meat, not strong meat. For every one that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong may belong to them that are full of age, even those who are the reason have use of their senses exercised to discern good and evil. In other words, I kind of got after the folks this morning in the, the Newberry Church because there were people in there and I told them, some of this applies to some of you. You haven't grown in your faith. Some of you by now should be teachers of the Bible, but you're not. You haven't grown any, and why? Well, it's because you haven't been putting the intention, you haven't been, you know, putting your time, you haven't made a priority, the Word of God. Folks, listen, listen, listen. The time will come, there is no chance this won't happen, it will happen. When the only thing that will matter to you is what's written right here in this book. The time will come that nothing else will matter to you. It won't matter what kind of car you're driving, what kind of house you're living in. It won't matter if you're healthy or sick, okay? It won't matter. The only thing that will matter to you is your personal standing with the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Folks, when, if you make it to heaven, then it's going to be your standing. What kind of crowns are you going to have there? Mm -hmm. See, right now is the only time you have. It's now or never for you. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that our lifespan is like a vapor mm -hmm. that appears before an instant. Mm -hmm. And you see, compared to eternity. Now we, if you're saved and born again, you will someday become immortal. But you will become immortal with a status. It's like going into the military and if you haven't placed up crowns in heaven, it'd be like being a career private E1. Okay? You're never going up in the world. And let, let me tell you, there's nothing better at all than getting to heaven. But you want to be you want to do a little bit more than just make it in, yeah. right? Yes. You don't want to make. You it want everybody. <laughs> you see, everybody in heaven will know by the by your position what you did for the Lord's sake while you could. In other words, did you spend your time working for Him or yourself? And that'll come to pass. Everything that's written here will come to pass. There's no chance that it won't. Everything already. You have over 200 <laughs> prophecies in the Old Testament. Most have already come to pass exactly when, exactly how, exactly where, just exactly like they said they would. And the rest will. There's no chance that won't happen. See, the world knows it. They kind of want to deny it. The way back in the back of their mind, because God gave them a conscience. They know it. And that's why they hate us. Somehow there's a mindset that if everybody somehow was to rebel against God, then God could not have his way. <laughs> yeah, he'd just give up. Yeah, he would just give up. <laughs> you guys don't want me, I can yeah. well, I don't think that's going to happen, folks. <laughs> and so, and that's what he says. So we need to be, we need to be in the Word of God continuously. There's no greater sense of source of knowledge or information in existence than what's right here. In all of these things, with all the little black boxes and the kids are running around with, and all of that, that's going to pass someday. 
Now I want you to go over to Matthew 23 because we talked about those that were dull of hearing. We talked about the dumb dogs, the pastors too afraid to bark. But you have the whited sepulchers out there too. And you have these in Matthew chapter 23, starting with verse 13 through 29. You're going to see something here. Here uh, he pronounces, the Lord Jesus pronounces eight woes to the lawyers. By the way, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, the scribes were lawyers and the Pharisees were the judges. Mm. And here uh, he makes it very clear. Now, I've been accused of my preaching of, of being, using inflammatory rhetoric. In other words, that's what the liberals will call telling the truth now. <laughs> if you say it the way it is, they, they call it inflammatory rhetoric. But what I preach is mild compared to what our Lord is doing here. Listen. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer you them that are entering to go in. Boy, do you understand what he's saying? See, when you get a woe from God, this is not a good thing. Okay. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you devour widows' houses, and for impatience make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive, now listen to what he says, the greater damnation. He doesn't use the word condemnation. He's using a stronger term here. Damnation. What is he telling you? He's telling you there are different degrees of punishment. And these, the religious leaders, these people that know, they're going to, they're going to have it. Just like, I believe there's a special hot place in hell for abortionists. Okay. That have killed the babies. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and then you, he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Mm -hmm. That's the apostate. But this is, again, the corrupt, corrupt, corrupt. We have a corrupt judicial system today in America. Remember, these judges were also the religious leaders. Woe unto you, blind guys, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple is nothing. Whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. You fools and blind, for whether it is greater the gold or the temple, the stand of gold. Number 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law of judgment and faith. These ought to have done, not to leave the others undone. When I was a, a teacher, I taught and a deacon over uh, a 501c3 Baptist church. Now, I was an independent conservative, but they were a 501c3. And you see, a real church does not have a board of directors. They had a board of directors. A real church does not have a constitution. They had a constitution. See, a real church has what? They have a board of deacons. The real church has what? Articles of faith. Okay. Uh, the real church does not have a secretary. They have what? An archivist. Okay. A real church uh, does not have an agent. You see, those five, here in a 501c3, the, the pastor under the 501c3 that he's agreed to, is, he's not pastor, he's an agent. In there it says the word that's used to describe him is agent. And if you go to Black's Law and look that up, it's got two definitions. One is uh, an intercessor between the congregation and the state. The other is a spy for the state. Okay. Uh, so a real church has a pastor or a shepherd. Okay. A 501c actually has an agent. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, I was in, uh, in one of these churches. I was a deacon there uh, years ago. And the pastor what, didn't want any part of that. But he came there and it was there. And what happened, uh, up until Big Jim... When, when Jim was in the hospital, up until that time, this woman that came there was the skinniest woman I ever saw. A young girl and her mother came, and I was standing out uh, by the lobby, and they came as a big, big church. And this girl, this girl was, uh, she was just skin and bones. And her and mother came in, and they, they said, is there any way that we could, uh, you could help us get something to eat? We're very hungry. And uh, 
we need a place to stay. And I says, uh, explain that. And they said, well, the, the grandmother, the mother's mother was in a nursing home and she was dying. They were only giving her a couple days left. And they had, uh, she had lived longer than they received. And the Catholic Church had put them up for three days, but they wouldn't do it anymore. And they said, we, we, uh, she's, she's not going to last another couple of days. And if you guys could help us out a little bit. So right at that time, they were having a deacon's meeting. And this was a fairly large-sized church with several hundred people uh, there. So I walked into the deacon's meeting. And uh, I said, hey, fellas, listen, we got a situation out here. Uh, we got a... Uh, and two women out here that really need a place to stay and uh, they need some food. So the one guy who was the head, you know, the treasurer, he says, well, how do you know that they're not drug addicts? You know, uh, we don't have, we don't have that in our budget. You know, we have a building program. I said, you fellas better explain to me, or is this a church here or not? Okay. Do we not feed the hungry, house the homeless? Do we not clothe the naked like the Catholics are doing? Now, if we don't do that here, then I'm in the wrong place, fellas, so you better tell me. Well, they, they, they always, they all thought I was a little dangerous. <laughs> you know, I actually said what I meant, you know. And uh, I meant to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. And uh, so they, oh, yeah, 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 yeah we will. And, uh, but you see, they didn't want to, and so they didn't want to help these people. They, they were, didn't want to take money out of the building fund. You had a, a girl here that was so skinny she was, hadn't eaten. So I took her, I took them out to dinner myself. And I, I bought them, I, I took them to the steakhouse. And she hadn't eaten so long, you ought to have seen her trying to eat the pieces. You know, just, it was unbelievable. Yeah, I sat there for hours, okay, uh, with them. But anyhow, I said all that to say this, and this is what he's referring to about the legalism here. In this verse, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you pay a tithe of mint and, and, and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. And that's exactly <coughs> what they were doing. They were they, they were more concerned about the building project. You had this huge building to below, begin with, and, and the different projects than they were with feeding the hungry. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. The priorities, look, we could have had the money I've raised over the years, millions of dollars. We could have had a great big entertainment center. I mean, we could have had a great big entertainment Some of the young preachers that, that when I first got into the ministry, we were all together. Uh, some of them, they, they were full of fight, and that, and that way they became pastors, and they got into the building projects. And it kept getting bigger and bigger buildings. You see, the Bible doesn't say that it's the buildings that were defeated. Mm -hmm. Right? In Matthew 25, does it say that we're to go out and build another wing and make sure that we have a paved driveway? And uh, does it say that we're to have a coffee shop? You know, I have these people that will, will tell me they brag on their church. We have a movie house, we have a coffee shop, we have a pool. I tell them, yeah, one of these days maybe you'll have the Lord Jesus there, then you'll have a church. Because you got everything but, huh? Yeah. Okay. And so, <clears throat> this is what he was, this is what they were talking about there. This is the, some of your big entertainment centers out there today. I want you to go over to 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to start reading. In verse 4 we read, For if he that cometh come preaching another of Jesus whom you have not preached, or you receive another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Now that word well bear right there, knock them all, it doesn't mean that you accept them. What he's talking about, the, the word there, knock them all in the Greek, means like if, if you're, you're holding it, there's something falling on you, or there's a burden. What you're doing is you're pushing back against it. That's what he's telling you about. That if they come preaching another Jesus or another gospel, don't accept it. Push it away. Push it away from it. And then in verse 12 he says, But what I do, that I will do, 
that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that where in their glory they may be found even as we. Well, he's talking about these false teachers, these false preachers that come and say, look, you know, we're, we're an apostle just like Peter, just like Paul, okay? And yet these were some of those that in Philippians it tells you that uh, they preached to their detriment they would preach the gospel and say, look, you know, you don't have to be like Peter, Paul, and John. These guys, you know, they get in trouble, you know. Uh, you, can, uh, you can get along with the government. You can serve the government and Christ. No, you can't. The Bible says what? You can't serve two masters. No. Okay? And so, and that's what you have out there today. This is what you've got with these uh, FEMA credentialed preachers or these Homeland Security uh, uh, preachers that that agree in contract, that go and they have the meetings with these people. And some of them have, some of them, their conscience just, they couldn't take it. And the Lord brought them under conviction and they come out and they told people. Uh, but there's an article that says, I have uh, in the back room, it's in my briefcase, and after I'm finished preaching I'll get that show some of you. But it's very good because he hits the nail on the head, something I wrote years ago. They actually sent me a letter wanting me to be a part of that, wanting to know if I'd be willing to sell out my congregation uh, in exchange for privileges for, for my wife and I. See, that's where we're living now. That's it. And, and they're telling you, demand, go to your pastor, because the pastors are told, do not... Tell the congregation, if your congregation has asked you if you are a part of your credential, <laughs> deny it. Lie. That's what they're telling you. <laughs> and then they give you these reasons why you should do that. Okay. And anyhow, here, this is what you have here in verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Folks, that's what you have today. Now, this should not be a surprise to you. This is what we were taught would happen, right? You know, so, you know, the Lord Jesus made it very, very clear, okay, if he abides in us and we abide in him, that we're going to be at enmity with the world, okay? And if we're not, if you're a friend of the, if you're getting along, everything is just... Uh, great out there with the world, uh, you're in trouble with God. Somebody turn to James chapter 4 and read verse 4. James chapter 4 and read verse 4. Someone read it real loud out there. Kevin, if you have it up on the board, whoever's up there, read it loud. Use your preacher's voice. The adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's I mean. Amen. And then I want you to go over to, and I want to close with Jonah chapter 3. And we learn a lesson from the past in Jonah chapter 3. Starting with verse 1. No, starting with verse 5. Well, no, I'm going to start with verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid there. Now, Nineveh was very, very large. It was a very large city. They had over 500,000 people living there. And boy, I'm going to tell you, they were known for their cruelty. And they were known, uh, they were a city that, were, that was involved in every kind of pagan worship. And they worshipped their fertility goddess, and also they worshipped Dagon, the fish god. So Jonah rose and went into Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days journey. In other words, it would take you three days to walk all around that, that city. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and cried, and said, Yet forty days, and none of us shall be overthrown. Now you see, the Lord sent him to preach repentance. He didn't send them to preach judgment. He sent them to preach repentance. But because of the way that they treated the Hebrew people when they captured them, you know, there were stories in that that, that they would be so uh, cruel that some of them would actually skin 
Uh, the Hebrew men hang their skins from their tents, their hides from their tents. But so Jonah did not want to be the fellow that goes back and says, "Hey, I, I was when I brought all of them up to repentance. These are people that the Israelis hated. The, the Hebrews hated these people for their cruelty." And uh, he didn't want to go home. He wouldn't be a very popular guy amongst his people, would he? So now he's he's going. He's telling them, 40 days, and God's going to destroy you. 40 days in your parking lot. Ha ha! Okay.